So um, I'm going to lead you in the meditation that I that I made up this morning. So uh, see how you like it. So as usual, we start by just establishing a, com a comfortable posture, coming into stillness. And you want to be very stable and upright in your posture, if that's manageable. And you can close your eyes or just lower your gaze. And letting the breath come to the foreground of your awareness. And letting the breath calm the body and mind. the very intentional use of the breath, of mindfulness of the breath. And now, opening your awareness to the sounds inside your own ears, what's called the sound of silence, or the nada sound. You're just listening kind of in your head. And there's a kind of white noise or Kind of buzzing in the ears that most people can hear. And while this sound seems steady. When we listen closely, we see that it's constantly changing, that it has a kind of vibrational quality to it, or a wave-like quality. Just see what you can detect in terms of the changing quality of the sound in your ears. Like the breath, the sound is essentially a neutral experience. There's nothing particularly dramatic about it. It's, typically, it's not really pleasant or unpleasant. It's just a sound, a kind of generic tone. So we can pair the pair the breath up with this sound just to help us to stay present. This sound of silence can only be heard in the present moment. So 
mindful as we listen, we are listening to the present moment. It's said that this sound is the sound of our nervous system. The electrical energy that is communicating throughout the brain, throughout the body, through the nervous system. So in a sense, we are hearing energy. Just as the breath brings us the energy of oxygen. As with any meditation practice, when the mind wanders, we bring the attention back to the object, to the sound of silence. It's possible to tune into a similar vibratory quality in the body. In the same way that the sound of silence is the sound of energy when we bring the attention into the body, we can tune into the felt experience of energy of the body as a field of energy. So you can if either expand from the hearing to the felt experience or shift entirely from the hearing. So either try to contain both the sound and the felt experience in your awareness. Or if it's easier for you, just shift the awareness to the 
felt experience of the energy of the body. And again, just returning the attention whenever you notice it wanders back to this felt and heard energetic experience. We are essentially tuning into the the core or foundational energy that is our life. Something that has nothing to do with identity or with language. but exists on a more primal level. If you are adventurous and curious, you might experiment with trying to feel your thought life on an energetic level. 
rather than seeing thoughts as words and images or ideas in the mind, dropping down to something, again, nonverbal, energetic, to see that thoughts themselves are also just expressions of energy that take shape and then disappear. Mental energy manifesting and decomposing. Um, so that just to give you a little explanation of what that was where that's coming from that the the listening to the inner ear sound is um something that Ajahn Sumedho, who's the kind of the senior 
student of Ajahn Chah. He's an American monk in the Thai forest tradition. And, and it's something that he kind of stumbled upon in his early years of monastic life. And he found he didn't gravitate so much to the breath. And then this, he started to notice the sound and work with it and, and sort of got Ajahn Chah's okay to do it. So, so he teaches it uh, as well. And he has a book called Sound of Silence. Um, and, and I heard some years ago, there, there's a teacher at Spirit Rock named Julie Wester. She's not, actually not, I think she's retired now, but she was, she was a senior student of Ruth Dennison. This is a little bit of a whatever story, but Ruth Dennison trained in Burma with a famous Burmese teacher named Uba Kin, who was Goenka's teacher, if you've ever heard of Goenka. And, and it was Uba Kin who really, in at least for contemporary times, developed this meditation practice we call body scan. It's, they called it sweeping. And so, so Julie was very much trained through that lineage to work with body sensations and body on an energetic level. And so when she was introduced to this sound of silence practice, she said that she kind of translated it into a body practice and realized as she started to tune in that she could listen, sort of like listen to her body in the same way that you can listen to your ears. And, and so I hear that and I hear put those two together and, it, and what I get out of it is that it's, it's tuning in to this kind of energetic level or really energy. It's not even an energetic level. It's, it's kind of tuning into these, these energies that you can hear or you can feel. And even, as I said, with thoughts that you can feel thought as energy. So it's, you know, just, I think I was working with it this morning in my sitting and I thought I would just share it because, because I think it's, I think it's helpful to taste different practices and, and sometimes something will really resonate and be like, oh, I can do that instead of, because not everybody kind of can work with the conventional, uh, you know, practices of following the breath. Um, and so, uh, you know, I hope you found that interesting. I'd actually be interested to hear if there's any thoughts or uh, questions or comments about it before I go off on uh, the evening's topic. Well, I'll okay. share that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I usually have a hard time you know, locating feelings in my body and, and and that, but somehow starting with listening, um, sort of, it was a good portal to the yeah. rest. So thank you for that. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, it's like, yeah, listening. Um, what is it? It's it's sort of a very natural way of directing our attention. Like, oh, I'm listening to music or I'm hearing a sound outside. Whereas listening to your body or feeling your body isn't something that we do in the same way. It's not such an ordinary behavior. So maybe, yeah, maybe starting with sound is a way to sort of sh almost like show our mind how to direct attention. I guess is how I would put it, but yeah, good. I'm, I'm glad that was helpful for you. Steve, I see you have your- uh, Yeah, real quickly, um, Kevin, the, uh, <clears throat> this, this concept of the energy, I just got back on Tuesday from uh, my first four day retreat at Spirit Rock, a silent yeah. retreat, um, just a life altering experience. And, you know, having been around so much noise in my life, <laughs> To yeah. be there in silence was really mind-boggling for me. I've never experienced sitting in a big hall with 80 people in complete silence. Mm -hmm. So that the energy of the silence yeah. kind of it was very powerful. And I, I, I did have a life-altering experience that I'm not going to get into here now. Maybe later I can share with, with everybody. But it was, uh, it was all about this energy that was coming through to me. And it was because uh -huh. of the silence. Very powerful. Yeah, good. Well... 
and th this can be the the sound practice can be difficult for mu musicians if they have um tinnitus tinnitus <laughs> yeah um but it's also a way that you can use that in a positive way uh, and kind of take it out of the unpleasant and just listen to it as a a meditation object um, yeah thank you um so all right i will uh come back to the um topic of the day which um as usual i am working with my book one breath at a time and uh we're towards the end of step 11 and this is a section called clear comprehension and it, it follows the section we talked about the other day that was talking about god's will the section is called whose will if you're if you're in the book it's on page i'm on two 241 and whose will is kind of about well if you're a buddhist and you don't believe in god how do you how do you do the step 11 where it says bring only knowledge of it for knowledge of his will for us and so clear comprehension this this section is kind of a, a continuation of that because the the previous section says um is kind of asking the question about making decisions what should i do next this is a tough question where our decisions determine our future life to some degree the buddha has a very specific teaching on this question called clear comprehension and i'm going to read a lot of this because uh it's it kind of is all relevant Clear comprehension in the general sense is the aspect of mindfulness that looks at the broader context of our moment to moment situation. While bare attention might help us to be very attentive to walking, just feeling our feet and legs moving down the sidewalk, clear comprehension notices that we have come to an intersection and need to look both ways so we don't get run over. Specifically, clear comprehension has four components and they are expressly designed to help us make decisions to know what, quote, God's will, quote, is in any situation. And be before I go into this, I, I just want to say that this definition, I lifted it pretty much from Ayakema, uh, and I believe it was from her book, When the Iron Eagle Flies. Um, and then I, you know, I kind of did my own commentary on it, but this isn't out of the suttas, I think this is from the Vasudhimaga, uh, actually something I need to look into where this comes from. In any case, um, this is, I think, a helpful teaching, so I will read it. So the four, four components of clear comprehension are question my purpose. Why do I want or not want to do or say this? Is my intention to help others or to further my own self-centered wants? If I can see that at least to some extent, my motives are good, I go on to the next question. Question my means. Do I actually have the personal ability as well as any material things I might need to accomplish what I'm thinking about? If my motives are positive and I see that I probably have what I need to get it done, deception oh yay <laughs> as we practice meditation for some time we see more and more clearly the layers of deception of self-justification of craving upon craving and finally come to know that virtually all motives are mixed perfect motivation or right intention is beyond the reach of most of us instead of expecting perfection we try to achieve some reasonable level of right intention if we didn't allow ourselves to act or speak until we'd achieved perfect pure motivation, we would wind up passive and mute for the rest of our lives. Yeah. When I question my means, I'm really saying, am I ready to do or say this? 
so often I'm, I'm going to skip over. I don't like this part. And not that I don't like it. I just don't think it's that um, useful. So I'm going to skip ahead. This is a lot anyway. Working with the third question, my alignment with the teachings is, first of all, a great motivator to study the teachings. Because after all, if I don't know what they are, how can I know if I'm in line with them? The first set of teachings that we need to study are the precepts because breaking these is the most obvious way we cause ourselves and others pain. Fortunately, if we are in recovery, we already have the fifth precept down. This is no small accomplishment. As I talked about in step four, the thrust of the precepts is non-harming, not to kill, which in Buddhism means not any beings, and also implies a gentleness towards others, not to steal or take what isn't offered to us, which can have broader implications socially, politically, and even with things like time. Am I wasting someone else's time? Not to harm others with our sexuality, being careful before we enter intimate relations, and even in the ways we flirt with others or display our bodies. Not to lie or use harsh language, becoming more sensitive to the ways we talk about others, gossip, criticize, express anger and not to use intoxicants, easy if you're sober, but beyond alcohol and drugs, being aware of the ways we use TV, music, sex, food, or any other diversion to stifle, numb, or alter our awareness and feelings. When we consider the precepts before acting or speaking as part of clear comprehension, we avoid making a lot of mistakes. Other core Buddhist teachings guide us in decision-making as well. Impermanence reminds us that things will change whether we do something or not. Suffering reminds us that there is no perfect answer. All decisions will include some discomfort or unsatisfactoriness. Not self reminds us not to take things so personally that much of what we think, say, or do is conditioned by forces out of our control. Loving kindness and compassion remind us to love ourselves and consider the needs of others no matter what we decide. These and many other teachings help us help guide us as we seek our higher power's will and try to live skillfully in the world. I think that's a really helpful section. Uh, I mean, I, I, when I read it, I think about how, how much those ideas, and particularly that third question, the alignment with the teachings and understanding the teachings and trying to, get, trying to keep them in mind, how much that informs my life, you know? Um, and, you know, it reminds me a little bit, Bhikkhu Bodhi, who's, you know, a great translator and scholar of, of Buddhism and, and also a, you know, very, you know, committed meditator. I mean, he's been a monk for 50 years. Um, he's, you know, he points to the fact that kind of in Western Buddhism sort of really gives primacy to to meditation, like that's going to sort of solve everything. And which, you know, meditation is incredibly valuable. But as he points out, if without really understanding the teachings and the basics, particularly the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, some of the other kind of key teachings, you're, you're not able to really integrate what you experience and what you learn through your meditation into your life, it, it's more like, then becomes more like a drug or just a, a palliative, you know, something to calm down or to feel good or, you know, space out. But, you know, the understanding really like trying to reflect on the precepts, really reflecting on impermanence, really reflecting on suffering and, and understanding the implications and then and then carrying that into your day just with kind of the clear comprehension of those things in your in your life then that's what i think brings about real transformation and real change that people i think come to the dharma for is you know people want to grow and to f have more peaceful more meaningful lives but it's not like you just meditate and then that all gets solved. I mean, I, you know, I hear that sometimes around 
recovery too that like oh you just meditate and then your cravings will go away and you know maybe but you know maybe not i mean sometimes you're meditating and your cravings get worse you know because you're not doing anything there's nothing distracting you and your mind just gets caught in a cycle of craving um so the so this under idea of really understanding the teachings i think is obviously it's really important to me it's it's why i teach <laughs> yes to state the obvious um so um yeah maybe uh, you know maybe i'll just like go back through this one more just the four elements one more time just and then open it up so question your purpose why are you doing something what so that's about intention about right intention question your means and means to me a good example of that and i do sort of use this example that i skipped over that paragraph about me and my wife because i don't always let, want to talk about that or, or even read it but this the idea that like can i say this skillfully you know if you're like if you're angry with someone you know can you communicate the import of what you're trying to say without being harmful you know so that to me the means isn't just like oh do i have like enough gas in my car or something it's like do i have the personal capacity to do this thing um and then question my alignment with the teachings as i said and then question the results which i think is that's a great you know um reminder to and you know to go back and reflect oh what happened and what can this is how of course we learn and grow is by you know looking at cause and effect and what what we did and what the results were so um i hope that's helpful and um so yeah i'll just see if anybody has any thoughts or comments to add tonight or questions. Okay, then. And Steve's got his hand up. Oh, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Steve. <laughs> yeah, um, the, the, the paragraph that struck me the most in this uh, talk tonight Kevin, and, and I wanted to share this experience I had on retreat, is this um, working with the third question, my alignment with the teachings, uh, first of all, a great motivator to study the teachings, because after all, if I don't know what they are, how can I know if I'm in line with them? Uh, that struck me because, you know, a couple things happened on this retreat. I've, I, I've never been to a place where I actually could leave my dorm room unlocked with my wallet sitting on the end table with hundreds of dollars of cash in it and my checkbook uh, and my keys and everything it took me a couple of days to actually get used to, to doing that <laughs> and uh so that was unusual but um i got up got there on friday and by sunday i had made this decision to go ahead and, and um, hike the loop trail well I don't know how many people are familiar with Spirit Rock, but for a 70-year-old man with uh, knee replacement surgery and two herniated discs in his spine and uh, having two heart events with 11 stents in his heart, it probably wasn't the, the wisest thing to do. <laughs> well, that would be uh, the second question. Do I have the means? <laughs> <laughs> do I have the means? Well, this is what I'm saying is the teachings, the profound thing that happened to me, my experience was not so much the fact, I mean, I obviously made it, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how, but I was not in good shape by the time I got back. And um, but it was through the meditations over the next two days. And it happened again tonight in the meditation is I created this story in, in my meditation and, and all these teachings that I've been working on over the last year. I was having this conversation with with Mara and Mara was messing with my head and then all of a sudden I'm talking to the Buddha and the Buddha is guiding me through this process and I'm going where is all this coming from how is all this happening 
how can I learn from this? And so I, I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to shut that down for the rest of the retreat. And I'm just kind of wondering the, the, what I'm experiencing now, I, I'm also, I feel so hopeful that I'm going to finally start to experience recovery with my food addiction. That's mm -hmm. the one thing I keep because of this process of, of studying these teachings and having that profound experience of doing something that could have literally killed me. So what was, what was your experience of eating on the retreat? Well, first of all, I was vegetarian and I'm, I'm a carnivore. I've been a big meat eater all my life. And so my body was going through a lot of changes with the food, but it was the structure the meals, 7 a.m. breakfast, 12 o'clock lunch, uh -huh. 5 o'clock dinner was profoundly um, powerful for me. It's, I'm not used to doing that kind of a schedule. And then sitting there and eating mindfully, every yeah. single bite I took, I closed my eyes because we didn't make eye contact. There was no conversation going on, clinking of silverware. But for me to close my eyes and choose my, chew my food slowly and taste every bit of the food <laughs> It was just a wild experience. Yeah. The whole thing was wild, but it's all about taking into these these teachings, this intention, and being mindful. Uh, again, I I'm so looking forward to our retreat at Redwood Glen. I, I've got so much <laughs> to build on now, so I'm really looking forward to that. Wow, you're going take you're going on two retreats right in a row, huh? Yep. All right, good for you. I feel like I'm an experienced retreatant now. <laughs> uh -huh. I just hope you don't get addicted to them. Because, you know. <laughs> well, there are some things in life where we can get addicted to that might be positive. And so for me, That's very uh, true. I, my whole life towards my feelings, towards my family, my wife, my life, everything I'm doing, this, this is my sangha. I'm committed to it. I'm, I'm going to immerse myself in this program. I've got so many ideas, you know, at some point I want to share with you, but uh, my life is changing and it's because of this practice. The practice was an amazing thing. Good. Thank you for letting me share. Lovely. Thanks, Steve. Nice to see you feeling so good. We'll try to make it harder for you on the next retreat, you know. Jeez, people. <laughs> oh, do I see? What did I, did I just see a hand up? Thought I saw a hand like up in passing. Oh, there we go. Okay. Who, whose hand went up first? Well, Cheryl, you go, you go first because we already been hearing from guys. Thank you. Uh, what comes up for me uh, is pause. I'm just uh, reminded uh, when it's um, when we're thinking about our intent, or um, if I have the means, and it, and it is it in, line, in alignment. When I remember to pause and give myself that chance to catch up with where I want to go, yeah. or um, that's 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 always a big one for me to remember. So thank you for reminding me. <laughs> yeah. I know that that's that's a great one and, and keep it simple right just that one one idea to catch yourself and and then everything else kind of falls into place in a way with the pause like oh stop wait what am I doing <laughs> why am I doing this where do I think I'm going here and b because in that moment you know if we are you know have that kind of quality of self-reflection and mindfulness we see a whole lot like, oh, this is my, t we see, we're reminded, oh yeah, this is, this is how I get into trouble or this is, or in a way, what did I do last time? You know, and you just kind of, a lot gets remembered in that moment. The, so good, good reminder. Thank you. Uh, Julia. Hi, I'm Julia. Hi. Um, <laughs> I like this book. My sponsor and I have been reading, studying the steps in this book Good. and uh, learning a lot of different things. Um, the I like this chapter because it just, you know, refers to what is my intention when I go into different situations at work or, you know, relationships or conflicts. What am I going to do with this? 
And someone said, you can use it as an opportunity to grow. I don't know if it was said at this meeting or another one, um, especially conflict where there's a, a stressful situation, like, oh, this is another opportunity to grow. Um, and being sober, you know, I don't know what God's will is or what I'm supposed to do some days. And I kind of go back to my uh, Catholicism a little bit and say, okay, God, you know, what's, what am I supposed to do? What's your will uh, or for the good, you know, what is the good thing to do in this situation? And uh, where is my focus going to be? on the negative or the positive. And I have had, I'm moving um, not too far from where I live, somewhere cheaper. And uh, people have been very kind and giving, you know, just offering their time. They're busy. One gal's in the tax business. She's been busy doing that. And she came over and helped me out. And then I heard she took someone else some soup. And uh, I've been very anxious at work lately just because of all the different changes in my life. And so I've been trying to think about this. And, uh, and then I, I'll say, what do you need from me that people at work are just trying to get outside of myself and not being caught up in my head and just breathe, you know? Um, but this, you know, what you said tonight in this reading applies to many situations in my life, being newly sober and newly divorced and it's just you know it's really hitting home i've been doing some of that this week so it's kind of nice to have have a different change in my life you know for the positive yeah instead of being stuck yeah that's a lot that's a lot well thank you and keep taking care of yourself yeah, thanks. Nice to have you here again. Thanks. Mike F, right? Mike F. Hey, Kevin. Oh. Thanks so much for, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I'm Mike, I'm an alcoholic. Thanks so much. I'm glad to see that you're still running these meetings. I haven't been here in a while. And, um, and actually I was recently out your way. I attended several meetings out in Locksburg and San Rafael and uh, so forth. And, um, but coming back to the topic at hand, um, when you were talking and, and thanks for your insights and, and, you know, both now and in your book, but um, it reminded me of a few things. One was, you know, practicing all these principles in all our affairs, you know, um, the principles and the precepts, you know, and, you can't do it if you don't know it. If you don't know what it is, you're going to have a hard time putting it into work in your life. And it also reminded me of the old saws about, you know, um, don't make any major changes in your first year. Yeah. And if you have any good ideas, call me. <laughs> and 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 the thinking behind that is, you know, that. Um, we need to learn. We need to learn and we need guidance. And even, you know, I mean, I'm an old guy, too, as you know, the fella earlier was talking and I'm an old guy, too. And I've been doing this for a while. But but, you know, you, you always could use a little help. You always mm -hmm. could use some guidance. And that's why I keep showing up at these damn meetings. You know, I mean, I just think it's good. I think it's a healthy thing to do. And I greatly appreciate you doing it. Thanks a million. All right, thanks. Thanks for dropping in, Mike. Nice to see you. Linda, hi. Hi. Um, hi, Kevin. Whoops. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I'm really delighted to be here. I um, I met you in, at the Shambhala Center probably about 18 years ago, and mm. my husband and I, and we used to go up there. We lived on the Cape, and we would come up for meditations, and you know, it's just funny how things happen. Um, I just celebrated 20 years and, um, hmm. you know, I'm at a place in my recovery where I'm so happy to reconnect with you. It's sort of like a hmm. magical thing. We, we found your books. We had them in our bookcase. We've moved a few times. We live out in the Southwest now and 
uh, New Mexico. Uh, so, uh-huh. but um, I just, but yeah, I'm, 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 we're thrilled. We're going to be following you and I want to know how to donate to your cause. And, you know, we just want to be back in, um, you know, with this, this clear comprehension. I love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> so that we're looking good. for some more clear comprehension really? and, um, you know, question my purpose. I love that. Um, you know, um, you know, we're, we're getting a little more elderly these days and our physical um, <laughs> stamina is not exactly what it used to be. My mm-hmm. husband and I are both pretty athletic people and we just, you know, we, we walk now. We take walks and do little hikes with our walking sticks and so forth. But um, I just think it's so important because sometimes I try to forge ahead physically mm-hmm. and I get hurt. And um, I, you know, I run too fast. And I also realized something about myself that when I take on too much, um, too much, just period, you know, just spreading myself too thin, I guess you could say that um, that really puts stress on me. And I think I can do everything like I used to do, you know, years back. And I, I just can't. So it's really, I have to do this. This is a very good um, exercise for me to do clear, clear comprehension. Like, what is your intention behind it? Is it really for the highest good? You just mm-hmm. want to prove that you're still young <laughs> and right. happening. You yeah. know, it kind of goes like that. So it brought a lot of clarity to me tonight to see this. And um, I am so appreciate you. So thank you for letting me share. Great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Nice to see you. That, so that was the uh, Boston Shambhala center yes yes yeah. yes in boston yeah, yeah i remember i remember you guys you do my husband's a musician so we particularly enjoy yeah. the music as well so yeah thank you thank you so much that's great dan t hello hi kevin um hi. i just wanted to share something i think is was pretty interesting so i go to a um a men's meeting, a 12 step meeting. And um, basically the whole meeting is, is, is crosstalk. People share and people, you know, offer advice, things like that. Yeah. Um, and the, um, at the beginning, the basic, there's more to it, but the basic sort of rule is it's three things before you decide to share or comment on somebody else's thing is, um, is it the truth? Does it need to be said? <laughs> and can you say it in a kind and loving manner? Uh huh. Um, which I think kind of sounds like very the, similar. Yeah. Isn't it? Um, yeah, I just thought, I mean, it's honestly that my, my sponsor has encouraged me to use that yeah. outside of the meeting, like just in, in daily life. And, um, and I just feel like it's just a, a wonderful approach to, you know, especially when I'm all riled up about something. Yeah. Um, yeah, just wanted to share that. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I and mean, that's really the, those kind of guidelines. I mean, I I think we have to you have to do it over and over and over to get to the point where you actually do it instinctively. Uh, but it's it's you know, and usually, I mean, for me, I don't I don't know how good I am at it still at right speech, but a lot of it has come, the improvement has come from that last step, which is looking at the results and realizing, oh, wait, that's not what I meant to do, or that didn't come out right. And just over and over, right, to having that intention, and then, you know, look, you know, kind of just sticking with the intention over time. So that's a good one. Thank you. Yeah. So Catherine K, let's We'll wrap it up with you. Nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you. How are you um, doing? Nice see you. Um, well, I'm doing really well. My daughter uh, and son-in-law and grandson, who's 17 months, just mm-hmm. came from Guatemala and they left like five minutes before the meeting started. Oh, so they th- they left, left to go here. back there. Or? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So um, yeah, it was a quick trip. They were here a week, but it That's was a nice. great. How are your horses? 
Spirit is doing really well. Um, I've got two jobs now, so I have a team of people like taking care of him and he's, oh, wow. <laughs> I'm not writing, but my friends are enjoying him. Well, that's <laughs> so, something, yeah, good. Thanks for asking. So yeah. I just kind of want to check in. I'm not exactly sure how it's aligned with what you read, but I'm coming up on 10 years of sobriety pretty soon here. Mm. And um, I, I called my sponsor the other day because I have to move again. And I had a question and she asked me, she said, do you trust yourself? Mm. And I was like, God, you know, I don't know. I mean, I certainly trust myself more than when I was drinking and using, but it's like the last piece of what feels like the healing process that you know goes on i'm sure for a long time but i just wanted to know if you would comment on 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 that piece of it because um i you know as somebody who drank and used for 40 plus years um i did a lot to harm myself a lot to undermine myself yeah. and a lot to not trust myself so i just wanted to get your read i just think that's a really great topic and i mean there's a few things that come up for me one is like i know that like there's a way in which the 12-step world particularly kind of discourages us in trusting ourselves in the beginning of recovery especially and and i'm so i'm glad your sponsor like wants you to trust yourself because i i think at some point i felt like my sponsor didn't uh mm -hmm. because it implies that she trusts you right uh and you know i think certain personalities <laughs> You know, we maybe maybe you're like this. It sounds like you are because I'm I'm like that. Like, are always kind of questioning and and we're suspicious of people who are are really confident about things and think they know what they're doing all the time. Who sort of seem to sort of what am I I thinking of? Like, just that kind of egotism that's like doesn't question themselves so so i think it's i think it's good to question yourself and to doubt yourself to an extent right but obviously you know i i, th I think that part of the recovery process is coming to see that oh yeah yeah i i i can trust myself you know i i I mean, this was not a recovery thing, but, uh, you know, I go on self retreats a lot and I, I was going on self retreat one year and I realized I was making a schedule and I was like, you know, I'm going to be alone <laughs> and I'm not going to be goofing off. Like I don't actually have to make a schedule for myself. I can, I can trust myself to do, to do the right thing. So it's more like, I guess I developed that in myself by looking backward, like, well, how, how am I doing? You know, do, do I seem like I'm not trustworthy, that I'm irresponsible? You know, it, 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 over the last few years, does my behavior look irresponsible? No, it looks like, and yeah, I continue to ask other people for feedback when I make decisions, but, but yeah, um, I have developed a, a fair amount <laughs> of, of uh, trust in myself, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that I'll ever be fully, uh, you know, believe in everything, but I don't know that that's a bad thing either, so. Thank you for commenting. I just, I wanted to hear your voice too. I miss our, yeah. uh, our mentor. Yeah, Mentee. yeah. Yeah. Well. It sounds like you're still Thank you. transitioning in what in some ways. So yeah, but so much better. Good. Wow. It's like on the corner. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, I hope to see you in person before yes. too long. Yes. Yeah.
All right. Okay, well, I will say good night to the group. Uh, nice to see that most everyone stayed around. Um, <laughs>